He sided with the Tea Party against the establishment, but now he's being hailed as a central figure in a new and unifying reform conservatism. From Washington, D.C., the junior senator from Utah, Mike Lee. Uncommon knowledge now. Mike Lee grew up in Utah, received his undergraduate degree from Brigham Young University in 1994, and then graduated from the BYU Law School in 1997. Mr. Lee has clerked for Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito, served as an assistant U.S. attorney in Salt Lake City, and practiced law with large firms in both Salt Lake City and Washington, D.C. In the Tea Party year of 2010, Mr. Lee was elected to the United States Senate on the Republican ticket, defeating his Democratic opponent by a margin of almost two to one. In recent months, to quote New York Times columnist Ross Douthat, quote, the junior senator from Utah has pivoted from leading the defund Obamacare movement to basically becoming a one-stop shop for provocative reform ideas. Lee's proposals are more interesting and more promising than almost anything Republicans campaigned on in 2012. Senator Lee, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> the need for conservative reform. It's hard to believe you said in a speech at the Heritage Foundation late last year, but by election day 2016, we will be about as far from Reagan's election as Reagan's election was from D-Day, close quote. It's time to get over Ronald Reagan? Certainly not over him. It's time to move forward with an agenda that meets our needs, the needs of today. These needs are always changing. And when we think about the fact that 2016 will be a, uh, about as far away from Reagan's election as Reagan's election was from D-Day, it reminds us of the fact that we have to constantly be looking for ways to retool our agenda. All right. Um, Ramesh Panuru in National Review. After the election of Barack Obama, he writes, the GOP, quote, was consumed by a bitter debate over the legacy of George W. Bush. Conservatives came to regard the fight against federal overspending, Obamacare, and big government as nearly the entirety of the conservative program. So you're elected in 2010. Does that feel accurate to you that the Republican Party in this, as it was represented here in the Senate and over in the House, was the party essentially of no, no to Obama? In many respects, yes, and with good reason. We always have to be mindful of the need to resist the kind of government we don't want. That's been something that has marked American history from the very beginning, you know, going all the way back to 1773 when some American patriots boarded a ship in Boston Harbor and they tossed crates of English tea into the water in symbolic protest against the kind of national government they did not want, a London-based national government that was taxing them too much, that was regulating them quite oppressively. It was so far from the people that it was slow to respond to their needs. You know, it, it took us 14 years to get from that moment until uh, we got to Philadelphia. So Boston was where we started protesting against the government we didn't want, and Philadelphia, 14 years later, uh, ha having uh, declared, fought for, won our independence, 14 years later in Philadelphia, we embraced the kind of government we did want. And so my point is that we will continue to have our Boston moments. We will always have those. A a as needs will arrive, uh, arise where we need to push back against the kind of government we don't want. But we also have to start having our Philadelphia moments, too. And that's what this conservative reform agenda is all about. Okay. I just I, I want to turn to you the reforms you propose now. But f I just want to make sure that point stands out very clearly. So it's an important element in your thinking, I take it. That is to say, there are times when saying no is necessary and valuable in itself. You wouldn't be one of the conservative reformers who says, oh, they got it all wrong during the first years of Obama. It was important to stand up during those first years. It's important to do that, and, and, and it will continue to be important to do that. It's not enough. We have to do more. We have to, in addition to protesting against the kind of government we don't want, we have to embrace the kind of government we do want. Now, one more reference to your heritage speech that you gave late last year. You drew a comparison between the present day and the late 70s and early 80s. 1976, the conservative candidate Ronald Reagan tries to wrest the Republican presidential nomination from the establishment candidate, Gerald Ford. This is the point you make. Reagan lost, but four years later, in 1980, he grasps the nomination and the presidency itself. Senator Mike Lee, quote, the difference between 1976 and 1980, the hard, heroic work of translating conservatism's bedrock principles into new and innovative policy reforms. 
that's what you're about now. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, in 1976, the conservative movement in America found a conservative leader for the ages in Ronald Reagan. But we, feel, still, we still failed to win an election in that year. We, we still failed to get that conservative leader for the ages in office in 1976. What really changed between 1976 and 1980, when we finally got that conservative leader for the ages elected, was that we developed an affirmative policy agenda, a reform agenda, and that's what we need now. So Margaret Thatcher said, first you win the argument and then you win the election. Yes. Same idea. Same idea. Okay. Senator Mike Lee's reforms. Senator Lee, once again, your Heritage Foundation speech, quote, I submit that the great challenge of our generation is America's growing crisis of stagnation and sclerosis, a crisis that comes down to a shortage of opportunities. So before you figure out the reforms, you define the problem, and it's overwhelmingly an economic problem in your view. Is that yes. fair? Yes. Yeah, it's an economic problem, and it manifests itself really at every level on the economic ladder. Uh, among the poor, it shows up as immobility. These people who very often are trapped in poverty by government policies. Uh, I blame not those who are in poverty, but the government policies that are trapping them there. In the middle class, you see a degree of insecurity where people, uh, whenever they find that they've achieved a, a, a little bit of additional income, if they're ever able to get to that place in the first place, uh, they find that once they have that additional income, it's been swallowed up uh, by uh, taxes, mm -hmm. by higher prices brought about by uh, inflation, some of it resulting from our monetary policy and some of it resulting from overregulation, uh, you know, costing uh, the American economy $2 trillion a year, and that, of course, gets passed downstream to the end consumer. And then at the top of the economic ladder, you see a, a different kind of problem, also created by government, in that you've got um, uh, people who are held in place at the top of the economic ladder by cronious privilege. Having climbed to the top of the economic ladder themselves, they're willing to pull up the ladder from behind them, making it more difficult for others to get to where they've gone. And some of these pe same people are held in place artificially by the government through a combination of subsidies and the kinds of regulations that create natural barriers on entry. So can, on the cronyism, can you, let me try for a couple of examples here. Uh, big agriculture is this written into the uh, agriculture bill each year. Is that the kind of thing you have in mind? Sure, sure. They, that's one manifestation of it. Where in some cases you've got sugar big price support that keeps the sugar, sugar prices going supports. in Florida. Uh, okay. Yeah, you, you've got subsidies. Sometimes you've got price supports, uh, import restrictions, and so forth. All of those things tend to choke out competition, and they tend to pass on higher uh, prices to consumers, to Americans who are made poorer. First, when they have to subsidize the production in the first place, right. and again, when they pay for those products at the store that are made with sugar. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a good example. Okay, let's take a few of the reforms that you've proposed. Excuse me, these are not all merely specific reforms. You've thought these, each of the items I'm about to mention, you have introduced as a piece of legislation. Um, <clears throat> the Family Fairness and Opportunity Tax Reform Act, the centerpiece of which, as I understand it, is a $2,500 tax credit for each child under 16. The credit would reduce what parents owe in income taxes, dollar for dollar for dollar, and if that amount drops to zero, what they owe in payroll taxes. Is that fair? Yes, that's oh. an accurate description. Okay, so in all the vast federal tax code, why that change, Senator? Well, it gets rid of two significant problems <clears throat> with our current tax code. One is the marriage tax penalty, which many Americans are familiar with. Another one is the oh, you better describe that marriage marriage tax penalty, where uh, a couple, uh, both earning some income, might in many instances end up paying a higher tax rate because they're married uh, and filing jointly than if they were not. But the other problem with the tax code that most Americans are not familiar with, but that needs to be addressed, that's addressed by this bill, is the parent tax penalty. You see, when Americans pay into our senior entitlement programs. Uh, working parents do that twice. They have to pay into it twice. Once when they actually get their paycheck and pay their taxes, and again as they're incurring the very substantial costs associated with raising their children. Uh, because we have a pay-as-you-go system, you know, it, it's really today's children who will be tomorrow's workers, and tomorrow's workers will be funding the retirement benefits of uh, tomorrow's retirees. Right. And so, you know, according to a very modest estimate, 
conducted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, an estimate that uh, a lot of people have characterized as um, incomplete uh, and inadequate. It costs uh, about you know three or four hundred thousand dollars to raise a child to maturity. So uh, a, a married couple with four children uh, uh, ends up paying well over a million dollars um, in child rearing expenses. That's before they raise college. Their children. Before college, doesn't take into account any higher education right. expenses. Also, doesn't take into account lost wages and things like that. So, assuming it's a three hundred thousand dollar uh, per child estimate, that's $1.2 million that they incur. And yet, if they are otherwise identically situated to another couple that has no children, uh, then the first couple is, is really paying into the system twice because they're raising those children. They're paying roughly the same amount in taxes, assuming they have the same income, uh, the same mortgage, the same uh, pattern as far as charitable contributions. There will be a few differences, but for the most part, they'll have a somewhat similar uh, uh, tax situation. And, but we need to offset this penalty when it comes to America's hardworking parents because they're right now paying into our senior entitlement programs twice. So the family that raises four kids, they're paying the payroll taxes that go into the Social Security Trust Fund right now, but they're also raising the workers who will support the childless couple in their old age. Exactly. Got it. Now. Here's, there's pushback on that, as you know. Patrick Brent Brennan in National Review Online, quote, who would end up paying more under Senator Lee's plan? Single, childless, relatively affluent people, especially those who live in high tax jurisdictions, because your plan would eliminate the deduction for state and local income taxes. It's a big tax cut for having children, close quote. So the argument would be that just as the liberals use the tax code for their kind of social engineering, Mike Lee pro-family, has a particular vision of, of the American family, wants to use the tax code for his kind of social engineering. Yeah, that's not a fair characterization. That's not a fair argument. And the reason why is this is just trying to offset a penalty that parents face today. This is, it still doesn't get rid of the penalty entirely. It's just there to uh, offset it to some extent. Whether you like it or not, our, our senior entitlement programs today, Social Security and Medicare, are paid for on this pay-as-you-go system, right. meaning that tomorrow's retirees will be paid for, will have these benefits funded by tomorrow's workers, today's children. And as long as that remains the case, we need to adjust our tax code to reflect that reality and make sure that we are not unfairly taxing parents. Got it. The Working Families Flexibility Act <clears throat> and the Transportation Empowerment Act. Let's take the Flexibility Act first. Just briefly, what would that act accomplish and why does that matter? Okay, so a government worker today uh, can have and enjoy the flexibility that comes from an arrangement whereby if a worker puts in 40 hours in a work week, but let's say uh, is really busy on Monday and Tuesday, they can take a little bit less time, put a little bit of less, less time in the office on Thursday and Friday, maybe go home early and spend more time with the kids. Right. That kind of arrangement is not only permissible, it's commonplace in the government workplace. Right. But our federal labor laws right now make that kind of arrangement basically impossible in the private sector. You, you can't have the same flex time arrangement in the private sector. And this is wrong. If it's good enough for government workers, it, it ought to be something that we make available to private sector workers as well. This is about allowing America's moms and dads to spend more time with their children uh, and, and also to work in a way that more appropriately reflects the demands at work uh, as the demands at work might wax and wane during the course of any one week or month. And I, you make that sound so transparently sensible that I'm trying to figure out who are you bumping into here? What are the, what are the political interests that would, be, that would oppose that act? Okay, so it's... Department of Labor is responsible for the regulations that, yes. are, that are a problem here? Yes. And, and see, this is part of the problem with Washington, is that Washington has gotten so mired into the intricate details right, sure. of the lives of hardworking men and women. Uh, uh, on the ground level, you know, people who are not working in, in any capacity that makes them have a logical nexus to the federal government. But Congress is still insisting on micromanaging the way that they work. And so it's really just inertia. It's the fact that this is the way we've done things for decades, so uh, we're stuck in this unless or until somebody changes the policy. Okay. The Transportation Empowerment Act. Again, briefly, what would it do and why does that matter? Okay. 
the Transportation Empowerment Act would allow state governments to do more with less money relative to the development of their transportation infrastructure. In a nutshell, it would take the, the current federal gasoline tax, which is 18.4 cents per gallon, and lower it to 3.7 cents per gallon. The portion of that 18.4 cents per gallon that would remain in the federal government's hands after this uh, passed, uh, that 3.7 cents per gallon, right. would be there for the maintenance of the, the federal highway system, the interstate highway network. Right. Uh, the rest of that money could then be collected by the states and spent by the states without the federal the regulatory difference over, the, overlay. The difference between the, in other words, the states yes. would get a shot at about 15 cents a gallon. Yes. The difference between the 18.4 cents per gallon and the 3.7 cents per gallon w would then be something that could be collected and spent entirely by the states without the federal regulatory overlay. For instance, the Davis-Bacon wage requirements and all the other federal regulations that make all of these uh, federal transportation projects a lot more difficult, time-consuming, and expensive. The net result of all of this is that we would get more roads and more bridges, in some cases more transit systems, developed for less money. And they could be developed faster and more effectively, more efficiently. This in turn would ultimately lead to an increase in the supply of affordable housing. More Americans could live closer to where they work because this transportation money would be spent more effectively, more efficiently. Okay, the premise is that the states can spend it better than the feds. Yes. Got it. And it should never be going to Washington in the first place. Right. Especially given that what Washington does is it takes the money to Washington, runs it through Washington's filter, skims a lot of money off the top, then sends it back to the states with all these conditions attached to it. Conditions that make this money not go nearly as far as it could go as if you just left it in the states to begin with. How many co-sponsors did you get for that? You know, I don't remember off the top of my head how many co-sponsors But it wasn't 99. You didn't get... It was not 99. Uh, th this tends to be quite popular among Republicans, and for reasons that I have yet entirely to understand, uh, it is less than wildly popular among Democrats. Uh, there is a lot of comfort in this town with leaving things in the hands of the federal government, notwithstanding the fact that we have butchered program after program after program, a as we have uh, concentrated in Washington, D.C., all these programs that really should never have been national programs to begin with. All right, Senator, we're talking about conservative reform here. Suppose I say to you, well, all right, on the Flex Act, you yourself said it's puzzling to explain why the federal government is in the business of making regulations. What about a, a, a deeper reform, just saying the Department of Labor ought not to be making regulations that affect workplaces, the biggest possible, ca in other words, from the conservative point of view, it almost sounds as though you're making, offering reforms that you yourself consider quite modest. Yes. It, it, here's the federal Leviathan, and here we have Mike Lee, who in his first two years got a reputation as a Tea Party, uh, vehemently anti-government, and when it comes to the legislation and reforms Mike Lee is actually introducing, they're only about this big. How come? If you've got an elephant and you want to eat that elephant, you can't swallow the elephant all at once. You've got to take it at a bite at a time. One bite at a time. We can do that in a way that still shows our bold colors as conservatives, that doesn't require us to put on pastels and blur the difference between conservatives and people who are not conservative. Uh, but we need to do it a step at a time. And, and these are very digestible pieces of legislation, very digestible reforms that could move forward sometime in the next few years and could uh, gain the support of a majority uh, of uh, the members of both houses of Congress. And so that's why it's important to do this. You know, Abraham Lincoln said that the most important function of government uh, w was to clear the paths of laudable pursuit, to lift artificial weights from the shoulders of all, uh, and, and thus provide for uh, a fair start in, in the race of life. And that's really what we're trying to do here. Here, many of these artificial weights on the shoulders of Americans are placed on the shoulders of Americans by the federal government. We're looking for ways that we can start removing some of those weights. We might not be able to remove all of them, and maybe not all at once, but if we can remove one or two of them here or there, that's a good start. 
So you're also making decisions about your career as a member of the United States Senate, I think. I'm putting this to you. So the, the old, uh, the old, it used to be the case, I think they still say it around here, that the old choice a senator has to make as to whether to be, whether to be a workhorse or a show horse. And in office, just over two years, you're not railing against the federal government. You're not just railing against the federal government. You have said, I want to get things done in this chamber. I want to move legislation. Is that correct? Yes, that's fair to say. But you're still I, not comfortable I, I, with it. Well, I, I, I would say that um, I, I reject the premise of the question that you have to choose uh, whether or not to, um, that you have to choose necessarily between uh, painting in, in, in bold strokes that show where you want to go long term and painting with smaller, more detailed strokes that show where you want to go right now. I think you can do both at the same time. I think you can walk and chew gum simultaneously. And, and I think this is an, uh, an attempt to do that. You compared, I quoted your speech at the Heritage Foundation at the beginning, and you talked about you're comparing today's reform conservatism with the Reagan agenda. And here's what occurs to me, particularly as we think about 2016 and a Republican candidate running for president, that the Reagan agenda, by the time he came into office, was just sweeping. And we've been talking about domestic matters. He set in place a domestic agenda, tax cuts, rolling back legislation, that launched a quarter of a century of economic growth. It's that Reagan recovery that makes the current recovery look so weak, so tepid. And I grant you your argument that if you were serious about getting things done in the United States Congress, you've got to take it bite by bite. But put all of this together, and I don't see that it's enough, so to speak, for conservatives to run on in 2016. There's not an embrace of new growth a new opportunity for the American economy, which you as a conservative, I know your embrace of free markets, I know you believe that free markets can do far more for the poor than the federal government ever can. So what's missing here? You're saying, you're saying this is what I've, I, as one member of the United States Senate, have attempted to offer. Let's keep talking. We as conservatives need to continue to continue the conversation. Is that what you're saying? I'm trying yes. So first of all, this is nowhere near complete. I, right. I've never intended to suggest that uh, what I've proposed so far is a complete package of conservative reform proposals uh, that can cure all of the ailments of the federal government. It, it is a good start. And uh, we, we're still moving forward with a lot more. But just as importantly, what we're trying to do here is to, to connect uh, a, a consistent thread of conservative thought through all of these proposals and the other proposals that will follow, those, the others that have not yet been introduced, uh, to connect them together and to help do what Reagan did, which is to help the, the average voter out there understand why it is that conservative principles will be good for them, why it is that conservative principles will help the poor, and why it is that they will help the middle class. Uh, that's what Reagan did so effectively, and that's what set in motion the sequence of events that led to the, the greatest economic recovery uh, uh, that, that we've seen in recent memory. And that's what we need again today. But the common thread is conservative principles connecting up the middle class and the poor and helping them understand how this benefits them. Okay. So Mike Lee's message to conservatives is not simply, not that it's all that simple, but here are four pieces of legislation more to follow. This is how it's done. Yeah. This is how it's done, or it can be done. All right. Let me ask you, if I may, to comment on a few divisions among conservatives, among the GOP, that if the GOP is to have a serious chance of capturing the Senate, moving on to capture the White House, need to be dealt with. By the way, if you don't think these divisions are as deep as the press tends to suggest, say that too, if you would. Here's one. Kim Strassel in the Wall Street Journal, this is just last week, quote, there's a new dividing line in the conservative movement between a majority who'd like to win against President Obama and a handful who'd like to win some scalps. And you know what she's talking about. She's talking about the government shutdown, item one, and then the vote uh, moving from a simple uh, vote by, I can't, I don't know the terms here, but cloture vote. Cloture, go, to vote where each senator had to go on the record for raising the debt ceiling. And um, you joined, or at least I believe you supported, you gave some 
comments to the press afterwards that you were in favor of or approved of Senator Cruz's insistence on each senator going on the record to raise the debt ceiling. And it's been suggested in the press that the effect of that, uh, the principal effect was to embarrass the minority leader, Mitch McConnell, who faces a primary challenge in Kentucky and a pretty serious, apparently, Democratic challenger in the general, and his, uh, the minority, deputy minority leader, John Cornyn of Texas, who, by the way, I Googled around, what, could, what do folks have against John Cornyn of Texas? I'm not a Texan, I didn't know. It turns out John Cornyn has a 98.5 conservative rating. So, so what about all this constant, what one seems, reading the press, I'm out in California most of the time, this constant kerfuffle in the United States Senate among Republicans. Okay, so What's there, going on? there are What's about going on? 18 questions embedded within that, and, and I'll, I'll try to <laughs> get to each More questions than I'm aware of, probably. Go uh, ahead. All right, so as to the first point, I, I, I here again reject the premise of the question that one must choose between, on the one hand, voting according to one's conscience, mm -hmm. and, and on the other hand, uh, winning elections. Uh, good policy leads to good politics, especially if you're consistent in the reasons for your voting pattern. And so I, I don't think that it's a good idea for us as Republicans or as conservatives to water down our message or to change the way we vote uh, just to make it look like there is less contrast. I think what we need is more contrast rather than less. We need bold colors, not pastels. I think when we paint with pastels, uh, the, the distinction becomes blurry, it becomes hazy, and we lose elections. So your, the default position in the Senate, from your point of view, ought to be uh, each senator ought to go on record. Well, yeah. That's, okay. I mean, look, we, we all have that is not an our own election certificates. Yeah. We, we're all elected by our own constituencies. Uh, we all have uh, the, the right to have our vote count just as much as any other member's vote. And so none of us ought to have to surrender his or her closely held views uh, on how best to cast a particular vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and nowhere is that more true than in some of the areas that where you're talking about, what, whether or not we ought to have a, uh, uh, a cloture vote, for example, as we had recently uh, approaching the debt ceiling. We as Republicans have made a big deal over the fact that Harry Reid has eroded the, the, the power that the minority party has as a result of the filibuster rule and the, the cloture procedures that we have. When we complain about that, uh, uh, on the one hand, when that is eroded, but then we fail to exercise it, or we exercise it in such a way that every one of us basically votes to proceed to cloture. Every one of us agrees, as we were asked to do, uh, to just let the vote go. Um, uh, every one of us was basically asked to vote for cloture by giving up the right to demand a separate cloture vote. I don't agree with that, especially given what a big deal we've made out of the fact that it's been undermined. And especially in the context of a debt ceiling increase, where we're being asked to suspend the debt ceiling for well over a year. This is a lot of money that we're talking about. The American people are concerned about this. The American people understand that, uh, sure, perhaps the debt ceiling has to be raised, but we need to put in place some kinds of reforms that will not leave us in a position to where we'll have to just be returning and doing exactly the same thing in another 12 to 18 months. We need to start to fix the problem rather than just reflexively raising the debt ceiling over and over and over again. So uh, when I saw this coming, I, I, I wasn't willing to vote uh, for cloture on a debt ceiling increase that had absolutely no spending reform attached to it. If I wasn't willing to vote yes on cloture, I certainly wasn't willing to grant unanimous consent uh, to uh, forego that vote. That's just the same as voting yes for cloture. Okay, okay. So that's a matter of principle and consistency. Yes, and, and, I, and I think- It doesn't even strike you as a hard decision. No, it was not a hard decision for me at all. Okay. And especially considering the fact that just a few months ago, a lot of the same leaders in Washington who told us that we needed to forego our cloture vote were telling us just a few months ago, it's the debt ceiling that, where we will focus our energies. It's the debt ceiling where we will really fight. So, but what about this notion that, there's, that the Tea Party, that it's within the Republican Party, it's the Tea Party versus the establishment? You know, look, there is always- is that just illusory? Well, we can't take it too far. Uh, th there will always be kind of a, uh, a, a gap. Um, there will at least frequently be a gap between 
a party's base and its elected political leaders. Uh, and right now, I think that gap, that gulf, is exactly the size and the shape of a conservative reform agenda. That's why we need the conservative reform agenda. This can help bridge that gap and fill that hole so that we can move forward uh, on, on a somewhat united front uh, in pursuing this agenda. Because the entire divide between the establishment and the Tea Party comes down to one question, how to respond to Barack Obama's agenda. Yeah, I think the that's Tea right. The Tea Party says vote it down. The establishment, broadly speaking, says, well, we may have to compromise here. And the, but as long as it's a question of responding to Barack Obama's agenda, that divide will persist. Is that yeah, the argument? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. And, and in the absence of a strategy, in the absence of a unifying conservative reform agenda, there will be a lot of bickering. That void will be filled. It'll just be filled with a lot of contention within the party that won't necessarily be good for the party. I'm trying to fill it with something that's positive that can unite us as a party and help us win elections. Foreign policy, two questions, two quotations rather. Bill Kristol, editor of the Weekly Standard, quote, voting yes on the congressional resolution to use force against the Assad regime in Syria, I'm going back a couple of months with this, would be statesmanlike, close quote. Senator Mike Lee explaining why he opposed the congressional resolution to use force in Syria, quote, we cannot ask our men and women in uniform to engage in a military conflict that does not present a national security threat to the United States, close quote. And there you have the divide between the interventionists, so-called, the neoconservatives, and, and what? Mike Lee how did you feel, for example, you've got, you've got Senator Paul, for example, who says the invasion of Iraq was a terrible mistake. Would you go that far? You know, I don't think it's helpful or necessary to go, back. To, to go that far. So, I don't think it's helpful or necessary to go back to past conflicts. But what I will say on this conflict is that if you, if you added to the quote that you just read, the rest of my analysis, you would see that I went on to say, that, moreover, you know, I understand that there are, a case can be made as to how this can end up in impacting American national security. Nonetheless, uh, we have to have an end game in mind. We have to be presented with something in which there is an end game that's positive for us. A and I had never been, still have never been presented with uh, a game plan relative to Syria that would show us a, a really positive outcome. For example, we don't know a whole lot about what exactly would happen, who exactly would take charge of a post-Assad Syria. Would a post-Assad Syria be more or less hostile to the United States? That really is an open question, a question that was never answered by the administration. That's, that's one of the reasons why I did not support the president's proposed plan to go into Syria. Okay, so your point on Syria, your point generally, I think, but help, help me, is not that you're opposed to the use of American force abroad, you want to make sure that the administration knows what it is doing, and your test would be, I think I've heard you outline two tests. One is, uh, the, whatever we're sending our forces abroad to do must address a threat to the United States itself. Yes. We don't simply try to, we don't put our men and women in uniform in danger to do good. They are there to defend the republic, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Look, we've got, we've got a lot of bad guys around the world. A lot, of, a lot of bad regimes that are doing bad things to good people. Uh, we, we cannot uh, uh, be in a position in which we're fighting every one of those bad regimes. It simply will not work. And test number two is we need to know, we need to know the military objectives and how it will end. That's right. That's right. So there's got to be a direct link to American national security, a direct threat to American national security, and a, a, a plan for getting in and getting out that would enhance American national security without subjecting it to additional unnecessary threats. Last of these divides that I'd like to put to you. Again, two quotations. The Wall Street Journal editorial page, quote, no Republican would vote for legislation that stifled economic growth, promoted illegal immigration, and added to the welfare rolls, yet they essentially will do just that if they fail to pass comprehensive immigration reform. Close quote. You yourself voted against comprehensive immigration reform in the Senate. Columnist Ann Coulter, quote, Democrats haven't won the hearts and minds of the American people. They've changed the people. They added millions of new liberal voters through immigration. So why are Republicans making fools of themselves to spot the Democrats three more touchdowns? Close quote. Now, the Wall Street Journal editorial page and Ann Coulter are seldom going to be, <laughs> there's an aesthetic difference if nothing else, but these are deep differences in the party, the pro-immigration and, and 
I don't know whether it's anti-immigration or secure the border first. How deep is that divide as you experience it as a senator? You, you know, I, I, I think that there is a significant disagreement mm -hmm. about the Gang of Eight immigration reform proposal. Right. Uh, but I think it's been oversimplified by a lot of people who just say, well, you've got th those people who are for immigration reform and those who are against it. First of all, I'll say that a lot of, a lot of the time when people refer to comprehensive immigration reform, what they really mean is immigration reform that includes a virtually certain to vest pathway to citizenship for the 11 million or so people who are currently here illegally. Um, th that's often code for that. When, when that, what we do with the 11 million people who are currently here illegally, that ought to be a question that we address down the road. There are a few things that nearly every member of Congress in both houses and both political parties will agree that we need. Uh, we need visa modernization and reform. Our current immigration code is sort of stuck in the Buddy Holly era and it can't quite get out. Uh, we need to update and modernize our legal immigration system and the processes that go along with that system in order to make the whole structure more effective and more efficient and, and more responsive to changing economic circumstances. We also really need to secure our border and we need an effectively functioning visa entry and exit system so that we know who's here, uh, we know when they've arrived and when they've left. Once we have those two things in place, not just and legislative. those should not be that hard. No, they shouldn't be that hard. And they wouldn't be that hard, but for the fact that a lot of the people who have gotten behind this and have gotten behind this mantra of comprehensive reform or nothing are in effect telling us, unless you're willing to lump am amnesty in there, we won't give you anything. Unless you're willing to pass everything we want, including amnesty, we won't let you reform anything. That's holding the American people hostage, and that's wrong. There were a lot of reasons why I voted against the Gang of Eight bill. Uh, one of the many reasons had to do with this all or nothing approach uh, and with the fact that this needs to be undertaken in a step-by-step -step sequential process where we need to uh, accomplish those first two objectives first and get those provisions implemented, implemented. And then we'll be in a good position at that point to figure out how best to treat the 11 million who are here illegally with dignity and compassion and respect for the rule of law. I think that can be done, but it's got to be done in the proper sequence. Do you want that done between now and November? I, I, I want us to get those two s steps finished uh, immediately. I, I would love to have that done between now and November. We could get there if those who are insisting on amnesty would simply drop their demand that all of that happen up front. Right. Uh, we, we ought to start in those areas where there is the most broad-based bipartisan consensus. And I'm telling you, we've got an enormous amount of broad-based bipartisan consensus for those first two steps. Okay. Senator, a couple of, I know you've got to go across to the chamber to cast a vote. A couple of final questions. Again, this is based on your comparison between the Reagan years and the present. The country's changed to some extent, in some ways, in some ways deeply. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, in a 1965 report entitled, quote, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, quote, listen to this. This is Daniel Patrick Moynihan all those years ago. The fundamental problem is that of family structure. The Negro family in the urban ghettos is crumbling. So long as this situation persists, the cycle of poverty and disadvantage will continue to repeat itself, close quote. When Moynihan wrote those words in 65, the illegitimacy rate among African Americans was 25%. Today among whites, over 30%. Among Hispanics, more than 50%. And among African Americans, over 70%. You could ref come up with reform conservatism on issue after issue after issue, but what does it matter if the American family continues to collapse? This is what uh, reform conservatism is all about. This is the entire focus of my conservative reform agenda is to help strengthen and bolster our, 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 the twin pillars of our civilization, uh, free market economies and voluntary institutions of civil society, including uh, families, including churches, synagogues, and other voluntary associations. The bigger government gets the more muscle that it flexes, the more the muscle of free markets and civil society will tend inevitably to atrophy. And so reform conservatism focuses on how we can get the federal government to pull back, especially in those areas where it's causing a lot of these problems, where it's making more severe a lot of these 
uh, societal problems, problems that relate to the family structure and so forth, where it's holding people in poverty, where it's creating undue disincentives for people to work and to get married and to stay married. If we stop creating those disincentives, if we get the federal government in the right place, I think that Not those... necessarily smaller, but in the right place. Different programs? Are, are you saying that at past a certain size, the federal government tends to crowd out family? Uh, it, it tends almost inevitably to crowd other things out as it gets bigger and bigger. So yeah, I, I am saying it's necessary for it to be smaller, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you simultaneously shrink everything in the federal government to a, to a, 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 at an equal rate, because there are some things that only the federal government can do. And there are other things that the federal government perhaps ought to allow someone else to do, whether that someone else is a state or a local government or a voluntary institution of civil society, for example. Okay. One more quotation about the way the country has changed. This is David Brooks in the New York Times, American exceptionalism, he's, is what he's writing about. Quote, now American attitudes resemble European attitudes. And when you look just at young people, American exceptionalism is basically gone. 50% of Americans over 65 believe America stands above all others as the greatest nation on earth. Only 27% of Americans ages 18 to 29 believe that." Close quote. The premise of everything you say in your reform conservatism is a belief in the greatness of the country. Fewer and fewer young people share that belief. I think that's a fair characterization, and I think it shouldn't be terribly surprising to us that this trend is developing in light of the fact that the federal government has given the American people, especially young Americans, a lot of reasons to be cynical, a lot of reasons to be skeptical about promises that it makes. Sure, we'll, we'll, we'll take your social security taxes, we'll keep them safe, uh, while at the same time Congress goes and spends that money somewhere else somewhere else, writing, in effect, an IOU back to itself, promising to, uh, to, to fill in the gaps uh, where, it, where it has robbed the American people of money that they put into what was supposed to be the Social Security Trust Fund. We've gotten the federal government involved in so many things that the federal government has inevitably created a lot of enemies and a lot of very cynical people. And so that's part of why this reform agenda is so necessary. If we get the federal government doing the things that it's supposed to do and, and starting to back away from the things that it doesn't do well, then I think we'll see a renewal of American exceptionalism. Last question. <clears throat> this, this November, 15 Republicans and 21 Democrats, uh, excuse me, 15 Republican and 21 Democratic seats in the United States Senate will be up for re-election. To capture control of the Senate, Repub Republicans need a net gain of six. Care to call it? Yeah, I, I think we've got a better than even chance of getting at least six seats, uh, gaining at least six seats in the U.S. Senate this November. Obviously, uh, we, we've still got a long time before that happens. Uh, we've still got about eight months left. And so it's too early to call, but I think our, our odds are better than even right now of capturing that. We've got a lot of uh, red state Democrats who are up for re-election. We've got a few other uh, Democratic senators who are retiring in states where uh, we appear quite well positioned to be able to recapture the seat. I, I told a lie. That wasn't the last question. This is the last question. When you think about the people who might be joining you when the next Congress is sworn in in January, and you think of Tom Cotton, now Congressman, Tom Cotton, Harvard Law School, two tours of duty in Iraq, now running for the Senate from Arkansas. You think of your generation of members of the Senate now, you, Ted Cruz, Barrasso, Rubio. This could, this chamber, the United States Senate is not, has not for, I don't think, a couple of decades been the place where the action was. But it could be, couldn't it? It could be. And a lot of the names that you mentioned, I mean, Tom Cotton is a very exciting candidate. He's done uh, great work in the House and his background and his, uh, his expertise will make him a, a very effective senator, and I look forward to working with him. There are others, uh, uh, others out there uh, to whom you referred that will be joining us. Many of them are younger Americans, uh, 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 much like Tom Cotton is. Um, uh, ben Sass in Nebraska is somebody that I'm really excited about, a, a, a younger American who's running for the United States Senate, and I 
frankly expect that he will win and that he'll be a great colleague. So you could have fun. Absolutely. Mike Lee, Jr., Senator from the state of Utah, thank you. Thank you. For the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you.